Hey friends, thanks for joining. My mom had seven children. I am the second oldest child. I'm the oldest boy. It might be fair to say that when I was a kid, I was a little bit mischievous. In fact, some might even tell you that nothing has changed in all these years. Of the seven brothers and sisters, none of us are the quiet type. We were always loud, opinionated, and kind of sassy. Now, from the very beginning, I was good with words, really good with words. It did not take uh, very much time for me to engage with my siblings before I could just spin together a couple of little things and stir up a skirmish. I can even remember right now, thinking back, I can hear my mom's voice saying to me, are you stirring the pot, mister? Are you stirring the pot? Chances are pretty good, I was. Upsetting my siblings with uh, words uh, that irritated them or I might pit one against the other. Uh, later on, uh, as I grew up, uh, I used to go hunting every year for about a week with my dad to some location. And we'd travel someplace and we would be uh, more or less gentlemen hunters. And by that, I mean that we didn't actually camp out in the area where we hunted, but we would go to the woods, we would hunt hard, but in the evenings we would go back, uh, we'd have a comfortable bed and a shower and a good evening meal. But then the next day, the alarm would go off at 3.30 and then we would be in our stands at least an hour before sunup. So typically between 5 and 5.15, I'd get to my stand and I would start this process. I would get cold and then I'd be freezing and I would freeze hour after hour after hour. And finally, at about 10.30, 10.45, I couldn't take it anymore. And I would take my frozen bones and climb down out of my tree stand and I would head for what we called camp. A camp was an area where we set up a tarp and we always had a fire burning. Nobody stayed there, but it was great for while we were there during the day. And so I would show up a little bit before 11, a fire would already be going. Johnny, my cousin, runs the whole thing. And I would sit down on a log near the fire and he would come over and put a grate on top of uh, the fire. And he would put a pot on top of the grate and he would hand me a spoon and he would say to me, Stir the pot, Brian, stir the pot. Now, this had a whole different meaning. What I was doing when I stirred that pot was taking a blend of broth and venison, vegetables, herbs and spices, and I was stirring them together to make a great concoction, which would reward all of us in just a short period of time. And by stirring, I also helped protect our food by keeping that which settled down to the bottom from burning. And I would stir the pot and I would stir the pot. And then the time would come for us to have some fellowship and community to get warmed up a little bit and get nourished so we could get back out for the afternoon hunt. But that also was stirring the pot. I was reminded of these scenarios recently when I heard a young pastor say that when we worship in song, we stir up our affections for Christ. Do you remember not so long ago when we would gather for worship together uh, at the church building? And we would always sing a few songs together before the sermon. Even if on those mornings you woke up and you got started for your church day and it was helter skelter and you're trying to get everybody ready and try to get everybody fed and in the car so you could get there on time. And so you kind of roll in and you haven't really focused on God any, so you haven't done any pre-worship worship. And you go in and in the first song, you know, you're a little slow to get going, but maybe in the middle of the song, all of a sudden the words just start to mean something to you. They calm your heart. They slow you down a little bit and you start to reflect on the praises sung to him. And your heart is stirred. And the words continue to point to our awesome God, and we are reminded, both you and me, of a couple of things. One thing that we're reminded of is that our Savior gave up the greatness of heaven to walk among us. In Philippians 2, 
Starting with verse 5, speaking of Jesus, we see that it says, Though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, I have to confess to you, when I consider that Christ gave up heaven and all that it offered him, he gave up the unity with the Father and the unity with the Holy Spirit to take on broken flesh, to become a servant, and then to be obedient unto death to pay for my sin. Yes, that stirs my affection for my Savior. And Christ didn't do that after I repented and came to him. I was still in the throes of my sin. In Romans 5, 6, it says that while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then he makes it even more clear when he says in verse 8 of the same passage, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And yes, that stirs my affections for Jesus. In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we are told that Jesus came to earth with an express purpose. Luke says it well in 1910, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And then in Titus chapter three, verse five, it says, when the loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us, not by works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And yes, that stirs my affections for Christ. So from these passages, I know that Christ gave up heaven for me. I know that he took on flesh for me, that he emptied himself and became a servant that he became obedient and died a brutal death for me. And he did that for me while I was in the throes of my own selfishness and my own sin. And not because of anything good that I contributed, it was all in spite of me. He did it because of his love for me. He did it because of his own goodness and mercy and he clearly displayed his loving kindness to me. So, with a hope to express a grateful heart to God for his sacrifice, his mercy, and his loving kindness, let's listen to this song of praise. Thank you. 
So in the song of praise, it says, God, there is nobody like you, God, and there will never be. And I pray that our affections, yours and mine, are stirred. And whether we go from song to the word of God or from the word to a song, that our affections are stirred. Pray with me. God. Stir us up, and after the song is ended, and the word has gone out, and after the last amen, keep us close to you, ever mindful of who you are and whose we are. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.